Hi YouTubers, Pete McBennett here with some uh, information on my VCF design. I know there's been a lot of interest in uh, some more details. And of course, it seems that you know a good VCF is like really what makes or breaks a synth in many cases. Um, so, let's get right down to it. Uh, this design is actually um, based on simpler building blocks. It didn't all just appear at once. I added things to it as they went along starting with, of course, the original LDR filter design, which is a, a state variable filter. If uh, you look that up, you can see it's a common design. Um, what I've done is uh, added the, uh, the, the uh, LDR control. Um, the, the original uh, design that I was playing with, I actually had uh, a dual gain potentiometer for the two uh, resistors, referring to the schematic, which is linked below, by the way. Same schematic as uh, in a previous video, but I put another link there. Um, the variable resistors, uh, R21 and R22, they can be a dual gain potentiometer. They're designed to be uh, controlled together for the filter to work properly. If you control one or the other, it, that's not how the filter... It, obviously, you can do that, you know. You know, there's no rules in creating interesting sounds. But they're meant to be swept together. And I happened to have some uh, LDRs laying around. And I said, well, what if I put LDRs there? And lo and behold, uh, it worked great. I liked the way it worked. And you can get a very wide resistance range compared to just like a, a one meg ohm dual gain potentiometer. The, uh, the off resistance is much higher. Than, and it, so you get a nice sweep. Um, so up here is the actual filter. As I said, it's a state variable filter, that's what it's called. And there's actually three different outputs. I use the low-pass output because that's the most commonly used in synth work. But there's actually a band-pass output and a high-pass output that you could access. Um, if, if I look at... Uh, here's, like, here's the original block diagram uh, showing the, uh, each, the three stages. This is the, uh, the low-pass output that I've been using. Uh, you could take a band pass from here and a high pass from here, but for simplicity, I've gone. I'm just using the low pass because it's the most uh, typical of, of a synth filter setup. Um, originally, I was, I was using these uh, um, the traditional triangles showing each op amp, uh, but then in new schematics, I've gone to the one linked below. I've gone to showing the package outline so it makes it easier to follow when someone's trying to breadboard it. Um, however, uh, either one, the, the, the triangles show more what's going on, but it's not necessary. It's, uh, uh, this is easier to follow for breadboarding. Uh, as I said, this is linked below, so I won't be just throwing that in front of the camera for the whole thing. Um, if you look at the filter portion itself, input cap, output cap, the two ICs, which are um, U4 and U3, one of the op amps is not used, this is all blank right here, um, and the LDRs, which are controlled with two LEDs, and shrink wrapped together. The LEDs, I vary the brightness, thereby varying the frequency of the filter, uh, so instead of using the the ambient light method, which is great for expression, I'm, you know, that's great. But obviously, if you want control of the tac decay, you needed, I needed some way of voltage controlling it. And I was like, well, I could control the brightness on LEDs, and after some, you know, adjustments and tweaking and getting, it, it's a matter of experimenting with all different values, plugging things in until you get everything kind of the way you want it, as, as best as possible. If you look at this, uh, this is actually a standalone filter. The two input and output caps right here. The two ICs and the two LDRs. Now if you notice, compared to the board, same thing. The two caps, input and output. The two ICs comprising the filter. And the two LDRs. What I've done is, 
added the attack decay generator and a few uh, necessary components to uh, um, um, to control the brightness smoothly. Um, the attack decay generator is pre. I like to keep things as simple as possible. How can I get these sounds with as minimal amount of components and, and off the shelf components as possible? That's what my design's goals are. The attack decay generator is just a 555 timer, which is uh, U1 in the schematic. And basically, it's, it's generating um, a high and a low signal, which charges and discharges the capacitor C3 through uh, D1 for attack, because that raises the voltage on the, on the LEDs, and discharges the capacitor C3 through D2, which lowers the voltage, uh, therefore controlling and controlling the brightness. Now, there's some stages in between, of course. There's a buffer. The, the buffer is is actually one half of U2 because you can't just connect the capacitor directly up to the LEDs because they would just drain away your charge and you wouldn't be actually having that voltage sweep. So there's a buffer which isolates the voltage from the LEDs because you need a way to to uh, control those without affecting the charge on the cap. And that's uh, used, this is just a buffer for isolation, which then goes to a transistor, which is on my schematic Q2. And that's basically, um, as you can see, that's what's actually driving the two LEDs. So the voltage, the up and down voltage, which it says VCF control voltage on the schematic, uh, is controlling the base of the transistor and then thereby con the transistor is actually then varying the current through the LEDs thereby creating the uh, the voltage control and as far as the um, attack and decay as I said that's a pretty basic setup with the uh, um, using one diode facing tor to charge the cap and one diode to discharge the cap that's a very common way of doing it. Um, what I did though, I'm using a 555 timer as my charge and discharge source. Of course, pin three being the output. And then what I did was, I set it up with an, another transistor, which is a Q1 on, on the trigger circuit. And that basically, so if I, a voltage pulse on the base of Q1, well briefly pulse low on pin three, I'm sorry, not pin three, uh, pin two, which is the trigger input. And that starts the uh, process. So what will happen is out, the output will go high, slowly charging the cap or quickly charging the cap, depending on the attack setting. Then when it reaches a certain threshold, there's a feedback wire coming from that cap before the buffer stage back to pin six, which is the threshold control of the 555 timer. It's, the 555 timer is basically just two voltage comparators going into a, a flip-flop. And so basically as the voltage rises and it's being sensed by pin six, when it reaches a certain point, it flips that voltage comparator trips, flipping the flip-flop the other way, output three goes low, and then it starts to discharge, lowering the voltage through the decay potentiometer and the rate is determined by the setting. And just a quick, like, this, sh this to show. Right now, let me uh, um, go ahead and both attack and decay are set way back right now. I'm slowly increasing the decay, attack is fast. And I've selected different values by experimenting for what I think is the best. I'm using a, a one meg on the decay. And let's, let's go to the attack. I, I, I have it to 500k, because one meg was just too long of an attack. Uh, 
It, as you can hear, the attack. Now there'll be a, and then a fast delay, hence the, because of the settings. Um, a couple other little things to mention. Uh, there'll probably be a part two because there's you know there's a lot of details I can get into. Um, what I've also done is, as the attack and decay voltage are, they come through this resistor. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this transistor basically, which is a voltage to current converter, for those who want to know. Um, and I've added another resist, uh, a variable resistor called R11. It's the cutoff. So that, that will determine where the actual high point starts. Let me actually, let me, let me uh, bring this, both of them very slow. See that? Basically that determines how, where the, the, the originating cutoff point of the filter is. So, um, the other thing that I did add, uh, of course there's a switch S1 for auto trigger, external trigger. Right now I'm on external trigger. Let me uh, just put this in, dial this in. And since I had an external, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an additional um, op amp not being used in the buffer, which is uh, U2, I said, well, why don't I just use that as a pulse, a slow pulse generator, AKA LFO. It's, it's just a square wave, it's not, uh, but that's all you really need because if I flip this, that gives, and as you can see on the schematic, that's just simply switching to that internal LFO with the flip of the switch. Now, let me show what happens now with, if I bring the cutoff down. Of course, that's when you get where you can actually start it from. Now, uh, I added an LED that's simply on the trigger input, just so you can actually see that the rate, purely optional, it's not shown on the schematic, I just threw it there as an afterthought. It's extremely low current requirement for this uh, little LED, uh, and it's basically just if on the, uh, it's before C1, it's just pulsing from the trigger. Let me flip this, that's triggering, you can see it flashing from the LFO. If I flip it over, it, it flashes from the trigger output. If you can see, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see a little bit on the camera. That's actually just being driven by the trigger output of, of the nano synth. Um, the, uh, um, uh, that being said, um, is there, if there's anything else I wanted to touch on for this first part, that gives you a good understanding of what's going on. Um, the, uh, oh, something I did want to touch on. I, I've been using LM358 dual op amps. There's a lot of choices and, and uh, there was, someone asked, you know, why did I pick that one? Well, originally I had LM1458s, also dual op amps, which work great. Uh, but the, uh, the LM358s uh, are actually designed for a single polarity supply. And as you know, I like to run everything off of a single 9-volt battery. Uh, the, the 1458 dual, um, dual rail, you can run those off of one. You, you just buy, you just, you're biasing it up to the upper rail anyhow. But since the LM358 <coughs> excuse me, is um, designed for single... Uh, polarity on the power supply, that's why I went to that. Um, you can actually use the old 741 single op amp. You can also use the LM324 quad op amp. Uh, the single op amp I don't use simply because it's only one per package. It takes up too much space on the breadboard. The uh, LM324, four in the package, that's great if you're doing a PC board, because you have four in, in the package. When you're breadboarding, it's, that's too crammed together. I find the best compromise is the LM358, which is designed for single polarity supply, and it's two per package, so you can, 
it's easier to to arrange things on a solderless breadboard than the uh, the, the the four the quads. They're just 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 too crammed together, in my opinion. Okay, I'm gonna let it go there, and um, I'll do a part two follow up if I feel I've missed anything in this first uh, little detail of, of how the uh, uh, the actual uh, VCF works. And then uh, I also have the uh, code perfected, not, well, completed, I'll say. It seems like nothing's ever perfect, but perfect enough, uh, of the Nano that I'll upload. Uh, as you know, I've, I've switched to the Nano for my PWM generator um, because I like having discrete notes uh, that are computer generated. It's the same uh, PWM output as the analog circuit. And if you think about it, comparing to the old analog circuit, let me just bring this in. Is that focused? There we go. You know, all that is replaced by just the nano. You know, so once I learned how to play with code a little bit, you know, it's like, this is nice because once again, it's all generic parts. Um, but you can get the Nano and the Uno so inexpensively now. And I said, that's just kind of the way I've been going. And you can actually put an Arduino 28-pin uh, dip standalone, you know, just all you need is the external oscillator uh, crystal and stuff. So, you know, that's an option too. But uh, anyhow, thanks for watching. Comment and question below. And uh, please, if you haven't already, hit that su subscribe button.